It's my pleasure to moderate this discussion with such a distinguished panel. Before I introduce them, I would like to explain a few, uh, I guess, guidelines as to why we're doing what we're doing. Um, it's not about whether climate change exists. We believe that it is a scientific fact. We could, uh, nor is it about the causes of climate change, whether it's human or natural or whatever, because we could spend the rest of the evening and in probably into midnight just debating that point, and because it's so mired in politics, we might never agree. So we're not going to have that debate tonight. We asked this panel to come to focus on one worrisome aspect of climate change, sea level rise. Each will address the issue from a different point of view, but each is grounded in the latest science, I assure you. I have asked them to make their talk as layman friendly as possible, but at the same time, you're not kindergartners, so you may be asked to do some uh, mental heavy lifting yourself. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Hines suggested to think of it as uh, in terms of getting a vaccination shot. It might hurt a bit, but it's good for you. <laughs> when the panelists have finished their presentations, we'll open the floor for questions from you. So now let's meet the panelists. In the interest of time, I won't read their biographies. You have them in the program, and I uh, want you to know that they, if you haven't seen them, uh, they are distinguished biographies. In the order of speaking, they are Dr. Albert C. Hine, Professor of Geological Oceanography at the USF College of Marine Science. Dr. Don Chambers, hold your applause till the end, please. Associate Professor of Physical Oceanography at USF's College of Marine Science. Dr. Oren H. Pilkey, Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Earth and, o and Ocean Sciences, Duke University. And Dr. Mark Hafen, Senior Instructor in the Department of Geography, Environment, and Planning at USF. How about a round of applause for our panel now before we begin? <laughs> so we'll begin with Dr. Hine, who will provide a broad view of sea level rise using a geological time, pers time scale perspective. Dr. Hine. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, David. Um, and thanks for having us. Uh, thanks for the uh, thanks to the provost for those nice introductory re remarks. The um, th this is an important topic, and and uh, I, I I'm a firm believer in, in in the more we we learn, the better off we are, and 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 better off to make uh, sound decisions. This is a a, a challenging uh, topic for sure, sea level rise. And and Oren Pilkey, who's a a friend and a colleague and mentor of mine. Uh, he and I have been talking about coastal erosion for years and years and years, and 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 sea level rise is a, comp a component of that for sure. But uh, given the projections that you'll hear from Don Chambers, um, sea level rise probably will become much more problematic in the years, decades, and centuries to come. And as a result, coastal erosion and and coastal inundation and and how we manage that is going to be a real challenge. And so it's a definitely a long-term issue, not a short-term issue. But the sooner we get thinking about it, the better. Um, how do I do the slides? Sorry? How do I do the slides? Uh, do I just... Okay. That's a quick presentation. Oh, it's he... No? I'm no, sorry. On the, on the computer. Oh, there it is. Okay, this guy here? <coughs> all right. Uh, okay, all right, hang on. I got it. I do this all the time in my classroom. All right, I don't have a pointer, but uh, just um, so direct your attention to the whatever screen is closest to you or whatever. And, and if you turn around and want to face away from me, I won't be offended. That's OK. That's, sometimes my students do that. I start talking, and they look in the other direction. So I'm, I'm used to it. Um, so this is uh, could be an iconic. Uh, this is an iconic image, for sure. Uh, I have not seen one that uh, perhaps uh, that illustrates the problem of, of what's going on in our coastal systems natu uh, naturally. Uh, around the country or e even around the world. It's the result of Hurricane Sandy that struck the Jersey Shore, and there's a, a roller coaster out in the middle of the surf zone, so th that's not supposed to be there. And so this is something that one could look at and say, gosh, is this uh, going to be uh, Florida's future? And, and possibly or possibly not. My role here is to provide a kind of a geologic perspective and, and geologic time, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about the, the, the modern day and, and the future as well. But as a geological oceanographer, 
I kind of live in the past, and and uh, the uh, but the past is important. Uh, Tampa Bay didn't arrive here yesterday. Florida didn't arrive here yesterday. The Gulf of Mexico didn't arrive here yesterday. There is a geologic history that's important to know and understand. And from that geologic history, we can make determinations about where the, where the future might lie, and certainly where the resources might lie, and and what what hazards uh, that the earth that the earth provided us, and what hazards the earth will provide us in the future. So this this is a wonderful artistic uh, drawing of of North America, and and if you look off to the upper uh, upper right is a uh, these are ice sheets. That's not snow covered. That, these are ice sheets that are up to two miles thick that covered the Earth. Uh, during the last glacial maximum about 18,000 years ago. We live in what's called an ice house Earth right, right at the moment. About the last past 2.6 million years, uh, the Earth goes from an interglacial to a glacier. We are, we're in, in, in an interglacial right at the moment. And, and, and if the 7 billion and the projected 4 billion people that are supposed to arrive in the next uh, 90 years uh, weren't here, uh, we'd be going into another uh, glacial event. And so we've just come out of a major glacial event, and it takes about 90,000 years to get into another glacial event. And so with this kind of ice sequestered on the continent, sea level is lowered considerably as much as 400 feet. And so 18,000 years ago, sea level was 400 feet lower than it is today, and it is today where it is. But uh, 18,000 years ago, and we have mapped, my colleague uh, Stan Locker over here and I have used geophysical tools to map the West Florida Shelf, and we can clearly see paleo shorelines that are out in 60, 70 meters of water. So that's one aspect. Now, jumping all around in geologic time, this is what geologists love to do. This is, I'm taking you back into the Middle Cretaceous 90 million years ago, and, and this is what North America looked like back then. Uh, it was a greenhouse earth, not an ice house earth, a greenhouse earth, which mean, meant that the earth was enormously uh, much warmer than, than it is today for a variety of reasons that I don't have time to get into, but sea level was much higher. There was no ice on earth. And, 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 and from a plate tectonic point of view, it was quite a different earth as well. But nevertheless, sea level was as much as 350 meters higher uh, back then than, than today, 1,000 feet. And so you add the two together, you get 14, 1,500 feet. The sea level has fluctuated over geologic time and perhaps even more. That's controversial controversial for sure, but if you just look at the map, you could see you could sail a boat from the Gulf of Mexico to the Arctic Ocean. And, and uh, that seaway that divides North America and the United States and Canada was called the Great Interior, the Great Western Interior Seaway, and, and there are Cretaceous Age rocks, marine rocks that exist throughout that area, and so that's why we know that exists there. And if you look at the southeastern part of the United States, it's completely underwater. And, and, uh, and, and of course, much of North America is underwater. So, so in, geology has taught us that, that the Earth is capable of fluctuating the ocean as much as 1,500 feet, perhaps even more. The, uh, so here's just another artistic drawing. This is what, uh, the, what Florida looked like. The Florida Peninsula looked like 18,000 years ago when sea level was 125 meters or 400 feet lower than today. And you can see all the green is land. And so the shoreline, the West Florida Shelf, was all land, and, and there were animals and trees and, and perhaps uh, pre-Columbian people that lived out there, uh, and, and now it's under, underneath uh, 400 feet of water or less, and then plus we can see those paleo shorelines. And here it is uh, 125,000 years ago, another artistic drawing, but based on geologic data, we know that sea level was about six meters or about 20 feet higher 125,000 years ago, the last interglacial. We're in an interglacial right now, but the last one was about 120,000, 100,000 years ago. Last time the glaciers melted and sea level came up a little bit higher than, than, than what it is today. And you can see this is what Florida looked like. The Keys were being built, they're underwater, um, and, and, and certainly the Everglades, and, and you can get a sense of what, how different the geography is as a result of, of, of a uh, sea level fluctuation uh, six meters higher. That's not what we're projecting that, or people are projecting that might happen to, in the next hundred years, but certainly the geologic evidence clearly shows that nature's capable of doing that. It's not impossible. Now, I love this map because it's local here. It brings us to our own area. This is called a merged terrain uh, topographic bathymetric map. And uh, basically, the, the green and the blues and, 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 and uh, aqua marine colors are underwater, and the yellows and the red are above water. And, and uh, this is during, again, uh, the, the last interglacial when sea level was about six meters higher, 20 feet higher than today, 125,000 years ago. And Tampa Bay was about twice the size 
that it is today. It's a huge embayment, actually, not really a bay, an embayment <coughs> uh, part of the Gulf of Mexico. And fronting it were two islands uh, consisting of the high areas of Pinellas County. You can see that circular area there is St. Petersburg, downtown St. Petersburg, and that northern area is where we are. And in between is a low area. And there are actually three major gateways or openings to the, to the Gulf of Mexico from Tampa Bay. One is the, is the modern day one, and then there was an opening between St. Pete and northern Pinellas County. And then northern Pinellas County up towards Pasco County, there's an opening uh, would have been, or there was, an opening to the uh, open gulf at that point in time as well. So you don't have to fluctuate sea level much to create uh, quite uh, significant differences in the geography. This is a uh, projected uh, artistic rendering of what a two meter rise in sea level would look like. Uh, the one on the right is, uh, the one, the picture on the left is what it is today. And the picture on the right is a two meter uh, rise in sea level. And you can see that the Everglades are flooded. And, and uh, what is particularly worrisome, particularly in those counties in South Florida, is that it becomes a long, skinny peninsula. That it's not only flooded from the ocean side, it's flooded from the, from the, um, from the uh, 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 Everglades side as well. And that's called, and you can see, if you look carefully, kind of a white area that defines the eastern side of the Everglades. That's called the Atlantic Coastal Ridge. It's a geologic feature that's about three or four meters higher than, than, the, than the Everglades. So only about 12 feet separates four and a half million people from the alligators. And, <laughs> the, uh, and, 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 and you look carefully there, I don't have a pointer, but if you look carefully, you can see how different Tampa Bay is, how the west coast of Florida, how different it looks. That's just you know an, uh, somebody's idea of what it might look like. We don't know exactly what it's gonna look like, but it's certainly not gonna be the same. And you can also see that there's some interior waterways that have become much larger as well, particularly along the east coast uh, of Florida. So um, I, I go back to this. I said, well, before sea level rise became you know, a hot issue, uh, we were already in trouble as far as our coastal system is concerned. And this is northern Pinellas County uh, about 20 years ago before there was major beach renourishment. And there are the, there are the waves are breaking right up against the seawall, virtually no beach at all. And we've had significant uh, beach renourishment in the last 25 or 30 years in Pinellas County, and so we have some wonderful beaches. But prior to that, there, this is what this is what uh, this part of the world looked like. And if we go back even further, this is an old scratchy slide that I dug out in the 50s. I can't remember this the, the source. I'm sorry, I apologize, but I know this was published in the 1950s sometime. And, and the black area, you can't read it, and that's okay, but the, the black means erosion, and most of Florida is erosional in 1950s, and, and where it's, the black line is bigger, it means the erosion is greater, and it's, an, it's a recession in feet per year, and, and uh, you can see that there are areas where there's significant erosion. That's generally around tidal inlets, and so tidal inlets are a huge problem in, in our barrier island system. The inlets themselves are, are unstable, and, and so a kind of a, a very basic idea in, in, in coastal zone management and in barrier island geology is that the inlets are inherently unstable, so stay away from them. Don't build expensive structures, but unfortunately, we've never learned that. We have not learned that lesson in Florida. And some of the most expensive structures that we have are right next to, or right along, the uh, most uh, unstable portion of the, of the barrier island coastline. The, uh, so I, I like to use this sports analogy. Uh, you hear it in football a lot, or you're used to anyway. The irresistible force meets the immovable object. The irresistible force being nature, and the immovable object meaning human in infrastructure. And that's everything from McDonald's to sewer pipelines to uh, parking lots to condominiums to roads to, to everything. And the question is, which one wins in the long run? And I'm betting on nature. <laughs> the, uh, so we have an, an enormous, we've made an enormous investment in our coastal system, for sure. This is, if, if you don't recognize it, this is in Sarasota. That is St. Armand Square. It's a very high-end shops and boutiques uh, there on that, on that small barrier island. That's a new inlet off to the top, and the Marine Lab is right in there someplace. And you can see how regular the coastline, and there's an inlet, and you can see the, the, the shoreline is not smooth or, or curving. It's quite irregular, and, 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 and those bumps and wiggles come and go even without significant sea level rise. And so the this is just a picture to show we made a big investment, and yet the coastline is inherently unstable. So here is one of nature's major forces, uh, Hurricane Katrina. I just downloaded this off the web when the hurricane occurred. Hurricanes are obviously huge hazards, and, and uh, we all know about the story of New Orleans, but the big storm surge actually occurred east of New Orleans, a little town called Waveland, Mississippi, and the storm surge was 11 meters. And, and uh, 
11 meters is absolutely normal. That's a tsunami. It was, and, and the people there considered that to be their, their tsunami. Most, the whole town was completely underwater. So that is something we have to worry about. That's a Category 5 storm. That's a Category 4 when it came ashore. And so we live in that world right now, not 2100. And, and, and some of the climatologists predict that storms, uh, big storms will become more powerful, but perhaps not as many, but uh, become more powerful. So this is an interesting diagram that, 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 again, I show classes. The top diagram and the bottom diagram are identical. Okay? The bottom diagram is a little bigger, but it shows basically the same thing. And if you look at it carefully, the top diagram is a four-dune ridge. And then behind that is a vegetated area, and there's a maritime forest and a marsh. And that's commonly what you get in a natural barrier island. And then the second from the top is a small storm. It's breached the four dune ridge. And you can see there's, there's a, what's called a washover fan that, that has penetrated. And so sand from the beach has, has been deposited in the middle portion of the island. Then the third diagram down is a, a big storm hits the island. And the island goes completely underwater and, and uh, is, is overwashed completely. And so sand from the fr front of the barrier island is eroded and, and transported to the back side of the island. And then five or 10 years go by, and the Four Dune Ridge, uh, with no storms, and, and the Four Dune Ridge is rebuilt. And you can see there it is vegetated. And you have the same thing all over again. But if you look very carefully at the bottom diagram, you see a dotted line there. And that dotted line represents the uh, original position of the diagram in the top. And so the whole island has been shifted to the left. It looks identical, but the whole island's been shifted to the left. But if that island is loaded with infrastructure, human infrastructure, what do you suppose might happen? Anyway, so I, I used to be a Star Trekky type guy. Resistance is futile. The, uh, so this isn't going to work. That sheetrock is not going to help that particular individual. And the first step in dealing with not only beach erosion, but perhaps what we're facing in the future is to stop building so close to the coastline. It's a brand new condominium. It was just finished, and you can see how close it is to high tide. This is just not a good idea to do that. Um, one of the most insidious uh, things about storm surge, or about hurricanes, this is a storm surge, and this is an actual data slide. Uh, Hurricane Camille, it's a open ocean storm surge hydrograph. And the bottom uh, axis uh, is, is in hours, and, and the vertical axis is in time, an hour, and uh, what's in feet, sorry. And, and you can see as, uh, as the storm approached, uh, MLW means mean low water, the sea level actually dropped because the, wind was, the winds were blowing offshore, and so, so the ocean level dropped. And then as a hurricane came onshore, you can see how fast and how rapidly and how far sea level rose. This is a hurricane storm surge and stayed up 25 feet for a couple hours and then dropped off very quickly. So this is what, this is, this is real. This isn't some model or this isn't, this really happened. These, this is, these are, uh, it, it's a real, like I say, storm surge hydrograph. And, and, and uh, so the, the, the time, the two hours or three hours, however long that is, sea level is that high, the damage can be enormous, uh, the currents can be enormous, and of course superimposed on top of that are huge waves. And so that's the sort of thing that perhaps, uh, not perhaps, but has happened along the U.S. coastline. And this is what it's capable of doing. I love this slide because uh, it kind of sneaks up on you on what, what it's showing. It shows a tree and a building in the back, but it's actually not a building, it's a, it's a barge. And if you look carefully, you can see the water line on the barge, and it's light colored, and then it has a black hull, and it's a three-story building on top of it. It's a huge barge, and this is a casino, a gambling casino in, off Mississippi. And, and uh, Mississippi has laws that they can't gamble on land, but they can gamble offshore, so they build a big barge tied to a dock, and you walk down the dock, and you get on this casino barge, and you can gamble, and everybody's happy. The governor makes money, and people make money, and the people on the casinos make money, hopefully. So, but the thing here is that that barge floated over the top of that tree and settled down where it is. So that's, that's what, what nature is capable of doing. So if we look at our own coastline, such as a wide barrier island, which is kind of unusual in Florida to have such a wide uh, barrier island. Uh, this is Sanibel shown here. With sea level rise, a uh, Florida barrier island could go from a wide stable island such as this to something like this. And Florida has a uh, sea level rise of about three millimeters per year, roughly. And, and uh, this is Chand the Chandelier, Chandelier Islands in the Mississippi River Delta, where local relative sea level rise is nine millimeters per year. And you say, how could that be? Well, it's because the land is sinking. The land is subsiding in, in Louisiana. And it's not subsiding here because we're up on a hard limestone platform. And so subsidence is not a factor in Florida. 
uh, but it is certainly in Louisiana. And so if we want to look at the future, there's perhaps a visualization of the future, uh, what Sanibel Island could turn into as an uninhabitable uh, sand strip. The, uh, and, and there could be many more washover events like this, like I showed you in that cartoon. And this particular diagram here uh, shows a, an erosional state, uh, shows a long-term trend, and then the, the wiggly line is a series of storms where there's post-storm recovery, but the recovery isn't quite as great as where the beach was originally, and so there's net erosion to the beach. And so that long-term trend could actually get steeper uh, with increased sea level rise. And so as a result, there would be more severe erosion along the beaches. And, and so what do we do? Well, <laughs> that's the big question. We could build massive coastal protection structures like the Dutch have done, and they're experts certainly in this. They live in, in lowlands, and that actually, that huge dike or the water there is higher than the roofs in those buildings. And that enormous in, investment that they have made to protect that village or town uh, behind it. And this could be, is this the future of Florida? Well, that remains to be seen, but that's what it might take. A short-term solution is perhaps build away from the coastline. This is Keel Island in South Carolina, and, and you can see there's a, the, the dune ridge has is, is, uh, is, is not been built upon. It hasn't been bulldozed down, and the uh, human infrastructure lies well behind, behind that and, and, and allowing a buffer zone, uh, uh, and, and, and maybe a 100-year buffer zone or a 50-year buffer zone or a 30-year buffer zone, depending upon the erosion rate. So when it's time, uh, to, when those buildings age out and it's time to take them out, the beach is at where they're located right at the moment. So, or do we, do we plan to initiate a wholesale strategic retreat over the next 100 years and, and head for the Appalachians, as some people has, have suggested? We don't know. There's a, one last thing that's uh, kind of an unknown as well, and we see this in the geologic record, but it, uh, as Don, I think, might will say, it's hard, to, if not impossible, to predict, or what are called meltwater pulses, where the ice sheets become unstable for a short period of time and, and discharge enormous amount of water into the ocean and so you have very rapid rise of sea level for maybe 100 years or, or 200 years or 50 years, something like that. Then the ice sheets stabilize themselves and the rate of sea level rise decreases. But we've seen this in the geologic record in that vertical scales in thousands of years and you can see there are a couple of meltwater pulses that have been proven to exist. And we've seen this offshore in our, in our paleo shorelines. There are a number of paleo shorelines and they, they, they're only a thousand years apart and they had to have formed during uh, these periods of, of ice sheet instability. So this is kind of a ringer. We don't, these are unpredictable how the ice sheets are gonna behave in short time scales. So to wrap this up, the future, um, time will tell as science gets better um, and our ability to predict gets better and uh, hopefully there might be some bright side to all of this. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hine. Uh, I can vouch for at least two of the scenes that he showed. I was in New Orleans in Biloxi six months after Katrina. I saw that, uh, that casino on the land, and I walked on the dikes at uh, Rotterdam and other cities in Holland, and they are truly 25 feet high, and they protect a good part of southern Holland. Now, uh, let's... Uh, Next, hear Dr. Chambers uh, talk about the science of measuring sea level rise and what the best estimated projections of uh, sea level change are looking out to the year 2100. Dr. Chambers. So I have to set this up here. All right. <clears throat> well, thanks for uh, inviting me to give this uh, talk tonight. I always enjoy talking to the public about the work I do and the science I do. Uh, so, you know, the title of my talk is What We Know, What We Don't Know, What We Need to Know. And some of you may recognize where this photo is taken. It's past a grill looking toward the uh, Don Cesar. And if you've gone out there recently, you know I took this picture about a couple of years ago because half the beach is washed away in the tropical storm of last summer, and that's talking about some of the erosion, not directly connected to sea level rise, but just erosion from these uh, storms. <clears throat> I want to present actual measurements of sea level rise from the paleo 
mainly concentrating on the more modern record, but I want to start with some of the uh, sea level rise records from the last 8,000 years or so. And this just reiterates the point that uh, Al was talking about, is that sea level was a lot lower 18,000 years ago. There was a very rapid rise in sea level as these two mile thick ice sheets over North America and much of Europe were melting very rapidly as we went from the uh, glacial to the interglacial. Uh, it started to slow down as the ice sheets, the main ice sheets were melting and we were left with the large ice sheets over Greenland and Antarctica and then remnants of glaciers in the mountains. The temperate glaciers and the glaciers in the tropical regions continued to melt. They're now almost disappeared. There's just the remnants of a glacier in Kilimanjaro and a few other tropical places, but those will probably be gone in the next 10 years or so. But the important thing here <clears throat> is to look at about 2,000 years ago to about 6,000 years ago, sea level had started to reduce its general rise. It was about half a millimeter per year if you go back to 6,000 years. But if you look at over the last two or 3,000 years, it's much less than that. It was very stable. <clears throat> and in fact, we actually have tide gauge records that go back to 1700, and we can see that. Oh, this isn't working. OK, which button do I push? Enter. OK. Well, I missed a slide. There we go. So our, our longest tide gauge goes back to Amsterdam, you know, one of these places where they're really worried about sea level, uh, mainly to measure tides. But it has a very nice record of uh, long sea level going back to the early part of the 1900s. And you can see sea level was fairly steady from about 1700 to the early 1800s, maybe the mid 1800s. There's a lot of debate about where this kind of shift changed. But starting in about 1850 or a little bit later, there is a fairly dramatic change in the sea level there. This isn't related to changes in the subsidence or anything like that. We've done lots of studies and there's no evidence of that. More importantly, if we look at a couple of other tide gauges in the same region, we start to see the same thing. Now, unfortunately, we only have about four tide gauges that go back to the early 1800s. They're all in Northern Europe. And so some people have argued before <clears throat> that this is mainly a northern uh, Atlantic signal. However, we do have a lot more tide gauges uh, that started to be put in around the world, starting in the late 1800s, uh, the Southern Pacific, the Indian Ocean, the North Atlantic, the South Atlantic, the North Pacific. So we have about 23 long tide gauge records all over the world, and they all show this general rise in sea level. So. Each of those colored uh, squiggles there is one of the individual tide gauges, and then the black is the average of all of them with the three-year average. And so there's a lot of internal variability of sea level. That's related to regional dynamics, ocean circulation changes, winds, things like that. But all of them are showing this general rise. Okay, so it's not just the tide gauges in the North Atlantic, it's tide gauges around the world, so we have a lot of confidence that sea level, at least since the 1800s, the late 1800s, has been rising somewhere about one and a half millimeters per year. <clears throat> and now people have argued that, well, we only have these at a few tide gauge sites, now we have satellites. And so that little red at the very end of that time series is from a global satellite mission measures sea level globally every 10 days. It's been doing that since the early 1990s. We have high confidence that it's accurately measuring sea level because we have tide gauges as well at the same time that we can compare the measurements. And you can see that it overlaps the measurement from these just these 23 tide gauges. So we have a lot of confidence now that at least the long-term trends that we're seeing in the uh, global mean sea level from these tide gauges is reflective of the global mean sea level. <clears throat> I have very high res figures, so some of them aren't popping up as fast. Okay. Nope. There. So another thing that we can get from uh, altimetry, though, that is 
more difficult to see visually from the tide gauge records are the patterns of sea level rise. So this is a map of sea level rise since 1993 uh, based on the satellite maps. And so the yellows and greens are all about three millimeters per year. So that's kind of the global mean rate. But you see several areas where there's much higher sea level rise, especially in the Western Pacific. Uh, and that is related to changes in the winds, which cause changes in the ocean circulation. There's a, there's a climate signal, a natural climate phenomenon called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which has a cycle of about 30 to 60 years. And it has gone into a different phase over this time period, and that's changing the trade winds and causing water and water in the Western Pacific to rise and drop a little bit in the, West, in the Eastern Pacific. You also see some changes where it's gone down a little bit uh, in the Atlantic, where the Gulf Stream is. That's reflecting a change in the position of the Gulf Stream, and there's large sea level variations associated with it. But on, on average, you can see that most of the uh, world's oceans are rising at about three millimeters per year. There's a few areas where it's rising a lot faster, some where it's rising a little bit slower. This, these patterns, though, are typically what we call multi-decadal variations, which are related to natural climate fluctuations like El Nino and Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And we don't expect these patterns to continue for a very, very long time, centennial scale. Now, we actually can take measurements of the temperature of the ocean. We have, since for the last decade, we have nearly global measurements of the temperature down to depths of about 2,000 meters. Before that, in the 1970s, we had what we called ships of opportunity, where we would uh, take temperature measurements from, you know, starving grad students would go out and cast the temperature measurements and make recordings of temperature on uh, trade ships and things like that. And, uh, but from that information, we have a pretty good idea about what the uh, temperature of the ocean is doing. And that's important because the heat and balance of the Earth over the last 40 plus years has been measured to be about one and a half watts per meter squared. And that doesn't seem like a big number, but I've given you the equivalent in there. And I don't know any of you who are burning 2,460 watt bulbs every day of the year. And imagine the entire population of the world doing that. That's a lot of heat. And we know that 93% of that is being stored in the ocean because the ocean absorbs heat and lets it go very, very slowly. And once heat gets into the ocean, it takes a long time for that heat to leave the ocean, especially because the ocean is constantly mixing that heat. Some of it is sinking and going out into the deep ocean. And so the ocean can store heat for a very long time. Now, if you remember the numbers that I gave you for the sea level that we measure from tide gauges, it's about one and a half uh, millimeters per year to recently about three millimeters per year. So over the long term, it seems like the thermosteric was accounting for maybe 40 to 50 percent of the sea level rise. But over the last 20 to 30 years, it's only about 30 percent. The big contributor is the ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica. So this is <clears throat> a, a map of the mass loss from Greenland on the left and Antarctica on the right in, in large drainage basins uh, that are defined by the uh, glaciers uh, around the edges. And this is uh, calculated from a satellite mission from NASA uh, that was launched in 2002. And it's called the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, GRACE. And basically, I can't describe in a few minutes what GRACE does but it measures the time variable gravity of the Earth. And you may think gravity is constant, it's not changing, but anytime you have mass moving around on the Earth, there's gonna be a gravitational signal associated with that, and GRACE can actually measure that. It has to be a fairly large amount of mass, but GRACE can measure it. And one of the largest mass losses or mass movements on the planet Earth right now are the uh, Greenland ice sheet and Antarctic ice sheet losing mass. So if you look at the colors there, over the last six years or so, uh, what's that? Yeah, six years, uh, eight years, uh, Greenland, parts of Greenland have lost anywhere from about three to four meters of pure water. 
Okay, so a meter is about 3.3 feet, so that's about 12 to 15 <coughs> feet of water equivalent spread out over that area. Now, a lot of you may not under, have a good feeling for how big Greenland is, so I've circled that one little orange region right there. That's roughly the size of Florida. So that is about two meters of water lost from Greenland. So if you convert that to feet, that's about six feet of water over the entire area of Florida going away. Where does it go? It goes into the ocean. And this is a time series of the uh, mass losses for Greenland and, Ar and uh, Antarctica that we can measure. And combined over the last 10 years, they've contributed about 11 to 12 millimeters of water, so about half an inch to global mean sea level rise. But if you put that into perspective, that's about 84 feet of water covering the state of Florida. Okay? Of course, it's a m much less when it's spread out over the huge area of the ocean. But the other important thing to note is that up until about uh, eight years ago or so, at Antarctica was thought pretty much not to be losing mass, that it was pretty much stable. But notice how it's changed fairly rapidly since about 2006 or 2007. It's starting to catch up with Greenland. So here's the uh, budget, if you will, of sea level that we have where we have lots of really high precise measurements. So the blue curve is sea level from uh, satellite altimetry from this global measurement. The black curve is the ocean mass increasing as this water is transferred from the ice sheets uh, into the ocean. And the red curve is the thermosteric component of it. Uh, this is a little bit darker than it was when I prepared it, but that's about three inches uh, of, of sea level over the last 20 years. Uh, and about 70% of it is caused by the mass being transferred from the ice sheets into the ocean. So what we need to know, it's all about the ice. Uh, I'm really sorry for this because I had it in transparency, so it was much uh, shaded. Uh, when, I, when I gave it, but I think it messed up when it got transferred to the uh, PC. But thermal expansion, as we understand it and that we can predict, is likely to continue near the rate it is. So it will probably contribute, you know, half a millimeter per year or so to sea level rise over the next century. Uh, West Antarctica has about 10 feet of sea level equivalent. Greenland has about 23 feet of sea level equivalent. They're the ones that are melting. They're the ones we have to worry about. What we don't know is how they will continue. Will they continue to accelerate at the same rate that, that we've observed? Will the acceleration increase? Will it decrease? We've done some studies of this, uh, some of my colleagues have, and this is our best estimate at the moment. So the take home message from this, we've looked at the various dynamics of ice melting over Greenland, over Antarctica, and we've looked at a lower bound, assuming climate scenarios. We've looked at an upper bound uh, with climate scenarios based on the mean rate that we're measuring now with acceleration uh, from the uh, melting of the glaciers on the peripheries of Greenland and Antarctica. And so the best estimate now of sea level rise for the next 100 years is about 80 centimeters at a minimum. So that's close to just under three feet uh, to probably two meters or about 6.6 .6 feet at a maximum. Uh, so you know, the, the take home message from this is that all climate scientists and all sea level experts that I know are now you know, thinking three feet of sea level rise over the next 100 years is more likely than not. And I'll end it with that. Thank you, Dr. Chambers. Three feet to six feet, think of that. Uh, next, Dr. Pilkey will provide a broad fra framework of the human problem dealing with changing coastlines. Dr. Pilkey. Could you help me with this here? Oh, that's uh, what, I'm not sure. Yeah, I do, yeah. <clears throat> While we're doing this, I'm, I'm reminded that when I was a graduate student at Florida State University in 1964, something like that, we went on a 
on a research trip to the Florida Keys, and it was right after a hurricane, and I think it was Hurricane Dora, maybe. But at any rate, um, all kinds of people who were on the Keys told us that this is the end of development on the Keys, and what a tragedy this was. I haven't been back there since, but I, I understand that some things have changed since 1964 in the Florida Keys. I need to go back one. Yeah, okay. So the big question I want to ask, well, want to ask, I, don't, I can't answer, is what to do about hundreds of miles of high-rise line shorelines in a rising, in a rising sea. This is a very serious problem. No other state has this problem. Um, the, uh, this is, this is the uh, Gold Coast in Australia. This is, they, this is their Miami Beach. But they only have one Miami Beach. They, they do not have any other uh, community that have this kind of, uh, shall we say, a Florida-type uh, development. That one tall building is 85, 85 stories high. And they're going to build another 85-story building right next to that one. So their problems are still are, are to come. Um, this is a, a diagram drawn by a, an Australian insurance company uh, showing what they say will happen to the Gold Coast. Uh, and I, I put those numbers up to that the insurance company said nothing about what kind of time frame this was, but this could be Florida. Look at the, the buildings there are, are basically abandoned. You can see the green vines growing up the, growing up the sides of the buildings. And you see the, there's no beach, there's a big seawall. The road that goes from place to place has now been elevated, uh, but there's not much to go to since the buildings have been been abandoned. Is this is this our future here? Is that um, the uh, in the eastern half of our country here, Florida is the uh, the state least prepared for sea level rise, both because of the natural terrain, the very low slope, and and the and the way the coast was developed, and of course because of state uh, politics. Um, don't worry too much about that. We are, we're even in worse shape in North Carolina because our state legislature, if you've been reading the media, you probably have seen that the state legislature has declared sea level rise to be illegal. So <laughs> that's one way of, of solving this problem immediately. So <clears throat> um, I'm assuming that, uh, that sea level will rise uh, around three feet. This is what our, the North Carolina Science Panel has, has come up with. A, they, they put it this way. They say it's going to absolute certain it's going to rise 15 inches. It most likely will rise 30, uh, three feet, and, and it could rise uh, five feet, something like that. It's the same thing here. The, um, a two-foot sea level, the significance of this from the standpoint of the, of the beaches is that a two-foot sea level rise, let's say within 50 to 60 to 70 years, um, will make beach nourishment impossible because beach nourish beaches will disappear so fast that the cost will be prohibitive. That's my my uh, my uh, assumption. Um, and also, we can we know this beach nourishment will soon become strictly a local process in terms of in terms of funding. Uh, as you know, the federal government is is trying to get out of beach nourishment and. Uh, and, and the total amount of money being spent on funding now is going way down, except the New Jersey thing, of course, will boost it up a bit. Um, the, uh, as a result of uh, both the, the high cost of beach nourishment and the sea level rise, um, I, I predict that Florida, within, when, when there's a two-foot sea level rise, will become entirely a seawall shoreline uh, from, on both sides, on all sides of, of the islands. Um, <clears throat> but in places like uh, Miami, shown here, uh, Miami and Fort Lauderdale and, and uh, Palm Beach, West Palm Beach, are, are all overlying a very, very highly porous rock known as the Miami limestone or the, or the Miami oolite. And uh, th this, this rock is so porous that some ponds in the city of Miami actually have tides, little, little bitty tides, but they, they are related to the tides offshore, which means that Miami is really sitting, sitting in the ocean for all practical purposes. If you build seawalls, um, levees, uh, dikes, ain't going to do nothing, although they might prevent some of the storm damage, but uh, they're not going to do anything about uh, inundation. So what M Miami is going to have to do, the great Miami seawall, which must surround the entire city, must, must go, down to the, uh, go down through the 75 to 150 foot 
um, uh, Miami Oolite. It must be like a dam, or, or in some fashion or other. I'm not an engineer. So the point being that, that, and I'm sure this is true in other places. In fact, it's, it, it's true in some places outside of Florida where, sitting, where cities are sitting on pretty porous rock. So it, it's not as simple. These are the things that should be planned for now that should, we should be talking about. And uh, I think Florida still has its head in, its, in the sand. Uh, when it comes to sea level rise, I think that what is what is being talked about is is very superficial, and 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 I I, I admit that the to get down to the nitty gritty of sea level rise here in Florida would be it's frightening, you know, the costs and the 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 environmental impact. The um, the seawall coast, of course, will 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 impact a, a great deal on on the biota, especially on um, on turtles and reefs. And of course, also will the lack of a beach will also impact rather heavily on, on the tourist industry. These are all things that ought to be thought about. If you don't believe me, you ought to think about it. And, um, and then we have, and then we have Manhattan. Um, actually, Manhattan, although Manhattan suffered very impressive damage in Hurricane Sandy, um, uh, really Queens and Staten Island and and. Um, Let's see where and Brooklyn, I think, are the areas that have are more susceptible in the long term to sea level rise. But the question is, is uh, Miami, is is um, Manhattan going to uh, trump uh, Florida? But I really mean Manhattan and Boston and and uh, uh, Philadelphia and Washington D.C., uh, Miami and uh, this area the, where. What are the cities going to do, the big cities going to do to the funding for the, for the huge amount of funding required for the Barrier Island? I, I assume, another one of my assumptions is that the, uh, that the, um, uh, the, the big cities will trump the Barrier Islands, and so the Barrier Islands will be on their own and will basically be out of, uh, out, out of luck. Who knows? The, um, this is North Topsail Beach, North Carolina. And that, that row of houses you see that's right out on the beach, that's all been removed at uh, local community expense. But the cost of moving each of those buildings was uh, $30,000. Just not moving them, but removing them, just de destroying them, bulldozing them, and, and doing a really nice job of getting rid of everything. Nothing was left behind. It cost $30,000. Uh, when when we bulldoze down these buildings, um, what's going to happen to all the components of a typical building? All the as all the asbestos and and on and on and on. So, anyhow, it's my view that very likely only the cities will remain protected in the long run by the year 2100, and that the barrier islands will be on their own, and and that I don't I don't know how to how how you're going to. Uh, uh, I mean, if I was king of Florida, I have I know what I'd do. But um, I'm not king of Florida. I couldn't get elected dog catcher here. <laughs> um, but I, I think I, I really do think that you, that uh, that that Florida has not faced. In a, I have not seen an example. Except you have some voices there, like Al Hine. You have um, uh, Hal Wallace of the University of Miami, who are saying these things. But um, officialdom in Florida is time for, for time to really ask these really hard questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pilkey. I, I would believe that uh, some of the council members and mayors from the uh, cities in Pinellas who are here have something to think about after that presentation. Um, and now uh, let's hear from what this means for our shores. Dr. Hafen will uh, talk about the Florida situation and what our societal response should be from a planning perspective. Perhaps it's not all as uh, do doom and gloom as it sounds. <coughs> All right, well, I'm supposed to make you all feel better now. <laughs> That's a pretty tall order. Um, I should preface my talk before I start is that I was trained by Dr. Al Hine as a marine geologist. 
um, but as he noted, I have wandered off into urban planning. I actually wandered, wandered from urban planning into marine geology and then back. Um, so I, I have the science background here, but I also have the social science background. And so um, I teach courses in USF urban and uh, regional planning program. And one of the big concerns we have as, as a coastal state and, and you know, teaching these students who are going to be our future planners is dealing with with all of the adaptation to climate change. And so what I'm going to talk to you about are what some of the techniques are out there and what some of the barriers are to you know, some of the things that Oren talked about. Because um, yeah, when you look at Manhattan, we're not going to just pick up Manhattan and move it inland. Okay, so they're going to get the funds. You know, this is the economic center of the universe. Um, and so they're going to they're going to take priority over our little barrier island communities. So what do we do as planners, particularly as local planners in Florida, um, to protect those barrier island communities or at least, you know, make them able to respond to what we see as a threat from sea level rise? So, so let me talk to you about what some of the key issues in coastal planning really are when we're looking at this. And we're, we're not talking just about inver, uh, urban planning, but we're also talking environmental planning as well. Um, and the, the big issue really has to do with vulnerability. You know, what places are most vulnerable um, in the face of sea level rise? One of the things that, that has been noted is that about 70%, by 2025, it's predicted that 75% of the world's population, or about 6 billion people, are going to live in coastal areas. Okay? So it's not just Florida, it's all around the world. Now some areas, uh, some coastal areas are not particularly well developed. Siberia, for instance, you know, not an exceptionally large number of people live there. But when you look at this map, the dark red areas are the areas of the highest population concentration. So you see that the tropical areas, the temperate areas, you know, those coastal areas, that's where everybody wants to live. And so all of this gets magnified in the face of climate change. When you start looking at the impacts of climate change, and in our classes we talk about more than just sea level rise, but sea level rise is certainly one of the most important ones. Um, when you put six billion people vulnerable as a result of sea level rise and all the other climate change impacts, you know, how do you protect them? So it's a global issue, but for us it's also a local issue. You know, we have um, all these people in Florida, we have a, a 23 million people just in the United States alone who live in coastal areas right now. All right, so all of those people you know, have to be able to, to face this idea of climate change and sea level rise. So population growth itself and development in coastal zones creates vulnerability simply, you know, if everything were static, it would be fine. If we didn't have storms, everything would be fine. But because we have storms and we have increasing uh, rising seas, and now we compound that with population growth and development in coastal areas, we create additional vulnerability, right? There is the physical vulnerability of just being exposed. You know, of that house sitting out on Topsail Beach that is, you know, mere feet away from the, the ocean that's going to get smacked by the next hurricane that comes along. You know, there is the social vulnerability that we as planners have to think about. You know, who are the most vulnerable populations? You know, we think, we tend to think about, you know, coastal communities, particularly in Florida, as fairly affluent, and these are people that are not particularly socially vulnerable. But then when you look at, for example, who were the most socially vulnerable in New Orleans? You know, they were more disadvantaged communities. They were still in the face of that, and, and you know, they are still a coastal community, um, and they were vulnerable. And in other parts of the world, certainly large percentage of the population that live in these coastal areas are vulnerable. You know, do they have the social networks? Is there the social safety net for them to survive you know, uh, impacts from climate change and sea level rise? Hello. Whoops. Okay, so then there's also economic vulnerability, and this is certainly a, a big issue here. We were having a discussion just at, at over dinner about how important tourism and you know that is to our, our local economy here in Pinellas County and, and the Tampa Bay area in general. You know, and so there is an economic vulnerability to that we have to deal with and how we have to plan for when we're thinking about what happens when sea level rises and, and we have to deal with that. So um, when we put all that together, then we have to think, okay, well, what are the obstacles we have to overcome besides the actual climate obstacles? And one of those is the reluctance to deal with these issues, okay? One of the things, one of the things that, that just gladdened my heart was the, the entire mission of, of this group um, was to have these discussions, to, to bring these, and I'm very glad to see so many people from the uh, local government here as well, because these are the people that 
really have to deal with this. These are the ones that have to mediate all the disputes and answer all the questions and, and all those sorts of things. But one of the issues that we face, particularly in the United States, is a real reluctance to deal with this, this climate change issue. It is astounding to me that we are still debating this. Okay, after, well, I mean, after everything that Don just showed, all of the scientific evidence, all of those graphs that go this way, okay, we're still debating this. The time for debating it is over. The time to take action is now. And so this is one of the first things that we have to deal with. And there is, you know, an inertia to doing that, all right? There is the problem of limited resources, which Oren brought up, the fact that, you know, some of the resources that we have been using, such as federal resources, are going to dry up, and then it becomes a local issue, you know, to deal with that. And the perception of costs, all right? Is it cost, does it cost more to invest in something that will prevent the next disaster, or does it cost more to fix up after the last disaster, you know? And so, that is a real, that's an economic debate, and that's more than just a debate, that's an economic analysis that has to take place, to look at what is your best cost option, um, and then where do those resources come from, all right? Weak coastal planning systems, and this goes into, the, uh, this is something that we talk about in our classes, of integrated coastal zone management, ICZM, all right? And the problem is we have, for example, in the United States, we have a federal program, the Coastal Zone Management Act, and what does the Coastal Zone Management Act basically say? It's up to you, the states, okay? So then the states have their own, or not, programs for dealing with the coastal zone management. And what do they usually do? We defer to the local governments, okay? Um, and so there's frequently a lack of communication. Um, forgive me, Warren, but one of the case studies I use is CAMA, okay? The Coastal Area Management Act of North Carolina and how horribly ineffective it has been at the local level because many of the local communities essentially get to opt out of whatever the state goals are. Um, and so these weak coastal, can uh, weak coastal planning systems become a real barrier to getting anything done because, you know, the federals will, nobody wants to step on anybody's toes and essentially nothing gets done. All right. And an, an issue we face in the United States has to do with private property rights and individualism, you know, people that are more concerned about protecting their own home than what the, you know, what's going to happen to the entire community. Um, you know, the courts have frequently sided with private property owners when, when governments have tried to step in. You know, so this becomes an issue as well. All right, so what do we do? Well, there's a bunch of different approaches um, that you can take. One is adaptation. All right, what do we do to, to actually adapt to rising sea levels? All right, we have to look at, you know, the Dutch. You know, they've adapted better than anybody else, all right? They've built walls, they've built dikes, they've done a tremendous amount of work in, in sort of an engineering faction. But there are other ways you can adapt to the coastal environment without, you know, building a 300-foot dike. Um, but, you know, what this says is this is an acknowledgement, at least, that you have a, a hazard that you've got to, to live with, all right? And so how are you as a community going to adapt to that? Of changing conditions. There is also the problem or the, the issue of what, what's called mitigation, you know, and that is incorporating into your adaptation, you know, acknowledging your own contribution to the problem, all right? And there are a variety of ways that we contribute to the problems of hazards in, in, in areas that are resulting from sea level. You know, the city of Seattle, for example, has made reducing its carbon footprint the center point of its entire coastal planning, okay? They've basically said, we've done a carbon inventory, we know we're, we're, we're deficient, these are the things we're going to do to try to reduce that, as well as try to adapt um, to the changing conditions, all right? The, the new operative word in coastal planning and, and really all urban planning is resilience to climate change. You know, this idea that you reduce exposure, you reduce vulnerability, you do more than just plan for the last disaster, okay? You plan for the future disaster. You plan for what's gonna be coming next so that you are prepared for it and that you have a plan in place. Our approach in the past has very much been very knee-jerk reaction. You know, oh, this horrible thing just happened. Okay, we move in and we rebuild exactly what was there before and just leave it there. And then the next disaster happens and the same thing happens. So, you know, resilience, you know, takes into account that, that you know, some forward thinking, you know, about how are we going to respond to this in the future, right? And then there is the, the idea of retreat, you know, moving away from the shoreline, 
right? And sort of reverse engineering what was there, turning it back into sort of natural infrastructure. And I'll talk about that in a little bit, all right? What you have to do as a planner really is think in a, in a combination of approaches. Um, you know, how do we adapt? How do we mitigate? How do we become resilient? You know, where do we have opportunities for retreat and reverse engineering? Um, so solutions, eh, you can call them solutions, but one of the things that I, I think that, that most, most of us agree with is we have to guide development away from high risk areas and we need to start it yesterday. All right, that is the biggest problem. Um, we continue to do business as usual in the face of changing conditions. All right? And you know, in, 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 in business, you wouldn't do that. You, know, you read the tea leaves, you see what's happening in business, and, and you make changes based on that. We don't do that in our urban planning efforts, and, and, and are certainly not in our coastal planning efforts, and we need to do that. Um, we have to plan ahead for recovery. Instead of just responding, you know, we have to have a plan in place for afterwards. Right. What are we going to replace? What are we not going to replace? You know, where are the funds going to come from? How is this going to be taken care of? Um, the more of that we do, the less money we have to spend when the storm comes. And so that's something that, that, that you know, with sea level rise, you know, going to increase the frequency of flooding and things like that, the more of this natural infrastructure we preserve, the better. All right. Another issue, in, in, and nobody wants to hear this, is promote a diverse local economy. When your economy is based entirely on tourism and your tourism base gets wiped out, you have nothing to fall back on. And so what do you want? You want your tourism base rebuilt, okay? What many you know, planning gurus say is you've got to promote a more diverse economy, an economy that can weather and rebound from damage because it's not all based on one thing that gets damaged. Now, that's easier said than done. I mean, what else do you do with a barrier island except for build hotels and condos and restaurants? You know, there's, what else are you gonna do with that? Um, so promoting a diverse local economy there is a little tough, a bit of a tough sell. Um, decentralized, resilient infrastructure. What they're basically saying is take the necessary components to survive, for survivability and get them out of harm's way. Um, you know, when you have your sewage treatment plant and your clean water treatment plant and, you know, your electric infrastructure and all that stuff all sitting in an exposed area and then the storm comes or sea level overtops it, you know, what do you do, right? So getting that stuff out of those, those areas and, and putting them in places where they can still operate in the face of, of some of these, these impacts of climate change are important. And I turn to this picture, excuse me, I turn to this picture, uh, this is well, does anybody know, recognize this? Yeah. That building in the back is an apartment uh, right next to Tampa General Hospital, all right? That bridge is the one and only bridge onto Davis Islands to Tampa General Hospital. And that standing water in front of there is Bayshore Boulevard, all right? This is Hurricane Josephine in 2005. So the major regional trauma center is located on an island with only one bridge accessing it, you know, that comes off of a road that floods every time, you know, the wind is blowing in the wrong direction. So not such a good idea, okay? So you have to locate your critical facilities away from these high-risk high areas. Now again, not much we can do about Tampa General right now. It's there, we have to try to protect it. But the next one that's built, don't build it at sea level, you know, next to Tampa Bay, you know, on an island. That's not, not a very wise thing to do, All right? And you have to plan for long-term community sustainability, you know, not just, okay, can we rebound from this? You know, what can we do to make sure that our communities are, remain intact and remain viable, you know, economically, socially, physically, you know, in the face of these, these climate change impacts? Um, one of, the thing, one of the issues, and, and, and a lot of engineers get involved in this, is, the, is designing homes and buildings for what they call passive survivability. What happens when the electricity goes out? You know, what happens when um, you know, the, the, there's flooding and you can't get things from your normal sources? And here in Florida, that's certainly an issue. What would we do without air conditioning? Okay? Not many of us have had to deal with that. Um, when you don't have the air conditioning, you know, how, do you, how does your house remain livable? Well, there are ways to design homes that can be livable without you know, electricity, without um, you know, a, a public water source, things like that. So you have to design that for that so that people can actually survive these, these disasters. Um, promote social resilience to decrease vulnerability. In other words, build community networks. 
Okay, one of the issues that, that, that came up in, in uh, New Orleans was a lack of, of sort of a, a community network to, for, for people to fall back on. They had nowhere to go. Um, and so they all ended up in the Superdome, and we saw how that worked. Okay, um, so promote, you know, having a community that is pretty tightly knit and that can rely, where people can rely on one another is important. This becomes an issue in some of these, these barrier island communities. In some of these barrier island communities, these are you know, vacation homes for some people. They barely know their neighbors. They come, they go to their house, they go to the beach. They don't really, they, there's no one they can rely on. All right. So what this comes down to is engaging the local community. You've got to have community input. This can't be done by a bunch of egghead you know, scientists up here. And it can't just be done by the, um, the government. You know, this has got to be a community effort. All right. So what do we do? Well, we have, you know, from a planner standpoint, we have a toolbox, but we need a bigger toolbox. Right now, we have zoning and subdivision ordinances where we say, yeah, yes, you can do this. No, you can't do that. You have to build this far back, that sort of thing. But these need to be tighter. These need to be stronger. Coastal setbacks are really important, but how far back do you go? You know, how far back is far enough? Um, building behind the dunes is great, but with sea level rising, those dunes are going to have to move further back. You know, so you have to, you, you know, this again becomes a, an issue where, you know, we can't predict how far sea, and how fast sea level is going to rise. But think of all the infrastructure we have in the coastal zone. It's not easy to move, but nature will move it for us if we don't move it. All right. Um, Land and property acquisition is a real potential tool. Now, nobody likes this because this means the government is coming in to buy property and you know, everybody you know, looks askance at that, but it may be cheaper for the government to buy property and remove all this stuff than it will be to repair all the damage afterwards. Um, in the event that we can't do any of that, well, there are some engineering tools we can use. All right? We have the Dutch solution, the engineering solution, barriers, walls, that kind of stuff. That will protect the infrastructure, but it sort of ruins the whole reason we live on the beach. You know, if you've got a great big wall around the, the bee, you know, you, you're not really going to be able to see the ocean. You know, who's going to want to live there? You have vertical retreat. All right, I call it the Kiwi solution because this has been proposed by some New Zealanders. Um, you know, this is for Auckland. All right, Auckland is in a pretty low-lying area of New Zealand. And what they're basically saying is sea level rises, we build up. Right? So we're not going to move back because they really don't have very far back to move. So we're just going to build up. We're just going to build the new parts of the city on top of the old ones. Now that brings to mind all sorts of you know, post-apocalyptic bad sci-fi movies but, you know, that New York City is going to look like. But that's kind of, yeah, you know, the fifth element, all that kind of stuff. But that's kind of where we're going. Um, there is the Pilkey solution, horizontal retreat. Okay, and that's also a real one. Where we have the opportunity, we really need to take that into account, and we have to make a hard decision to do that. All right, and then there are a variety of other engineering solutions. You know, shoreline softening. They have these these interesting breakwater towers and, and island arrays that they've proposed for around Manhattan to reduce the impact of storm surge. As sea level gets higher, you know, just the normal storm surge is going to create problems. And so how do you do that, you know, without building a wall around Manhattan? Well, you, you can you build some of these structures out in the water where they can reduce some of this, this vulnerability. All right. So, you know, this is, this is me suffering for science. Right there, on, that, is that, that is the corner of Bayshore Boulevard and Swan Avenue, about two blocks from our house. Um, and this was Hurricane Josephine in 2005. So what I would implore all of you to do is to have these hard conversations. Um, get engaged with your community. Uh, get engaged with your local officials. You know, talk about what the, thi the things are that you need to do to prepare in the face of climate change, because it's happening. All right, sea level rise is happening, whether you like it or not, whether you, you know, agree with it or not, and we need to react to it. And as planners, um, you know, it's going to be our job to, to come up with solutions like that. So, thank you. Thank you, panel. Uh, you certainly have given us a lot to think about. I, I assume that you all in the audience were as uh, somewhat surprised and enlightened as I was to learn this. Uh, even though it might not affect me, my generation, it certainly will my grandchildren. So now we want to give you time for questions to the panel. Um, since we started a few minutes late, we're going to go a little bit later than 8 so that we can have the, enough time to uh, give you a chance to ask questions. My associate Jacqueline Shewitt is back there in the purple. 
uh, has a mic. We'd like you to ask the question into the mic. Uh, please don't limit. It. Please do limit it to 45 seconds or less, and and direct it to whomever you want on the panel if it's a specific kind of question. And I'll try to go from side to side. So, uh, who would like to be the first question? Here in the middle. <laughs> I'll get things rolling. Uh, Gregory Wilson. Uh, any of you could probably take a shot at this, but uh, uh, I'll go to the senior member who has a more horizontal uh, kind of orientation. Uh, the people who build nuclear power plants, did they not get the memo? It just strikes me as if they're in the worst possible place with respect to what you're talking about this evening. Uh, yeah, yes, we have some spectacular examples in Florida. and. Uh, um, uh, yeah, they got the memo, but they uh, they didn't believe it. You know, they they need to be near water, and uh, uh, at, at the South Point nuclear plant in in North Carolina, at least they they took the canal well inland to get to the plant, so it's not quite sitting on the water. But yes, uh, uh, we can anticipate that some some nuclear power plants will have to be moved, and not and not very far from not very long from now. Uh, and that, imagine the cost. Well, you can probably imagine it, yeah. Imagining it here now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, you're probably not aware of that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Duke Energy. Oh, <laughs> not another Duke. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a comment about that? Well, yeah, I mean, it, Orrin probably isn't aware of the, the you know, the, the nuclear power plant here that's being shut down uh, due to damage, and Florida customers were charged in advance, or they attempted to charge them in advance for it, and now, so that's, you know, this is something that, that's being paid for, and, and they, were, they were going to try to build another one, and now they've sort of been squeezed out of that, haven't they? <laughs> well, that, I think they've been priced out of that for the time being. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next question. Uh, this is for Mark. Um, with regard to communities that are doing the right thing, are there good examples for us to look up to in Florida or the east coast of the United States? that are doing the right planning things to address this? Yes. Um, your poor neighbor to the south. South Carolina has a pretty forward-looking uh, coastal management plan. And communities in South Carolina are kind of in concert with the state plan. Um, and so they are, they are doing some, a pretty good job with that. Um, they're, they're, you know, every coastal area is a little bit different. You know, Florida's different than the, 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 the South Atlantic Bight, and that's much different than the, the Northeast. And so every, you know, the geology and the physical environment play a role in, in what you're going to do. But, um, you know, if, if, if we want to look at, at really good examples, you know, in the U.S., South Carolina is one of the better ones. Um, and then some of the Europeans. Um, you know, we, sh we need to look at what, what you know, England, uh, the United Kingdom is doing. Um, many of them have really well integrated coastal management plans, and I, and I think that's a key because that's where you have federal and local, you know, and in our case, state cooperation, all moving towards the same goals, um, so that resources are not being wasted. Resources are going to be used efficiently, and you know, you can actually make some make a difference. Thanks, thanks for your uh, th these uh, comments on sea level rise, uh, Mr. Clement. Just a very brief comment. You mentioned. Uh, in closing that this is a concern for our grandchildren and and I think we're seeing that in fact it's a concern for our grandchildren but it's also an immediate concern now so I, I think we need to rephrase that uh, the way we've been thinking about climate change that it's that it's happening now um, and Don Chambers uh, you know I think we uh, our understanding of ice sheets has changed remarkably in the last 10 years and um, what we we didn't understand it very well before, and I'm curious what the range is. So you say about three feet or a meter. Um, is it three to six feet? Is it three to four feet? So in the next hundred years, um, how, how good is that estimate? How, how, what's the range? Thanks. Well, so, so the range is about at the low end, three feet, and at the high end, a little less than seven feet. Uh, how well do we know that for the predictability? It's better than it was a decade ago. You know, a decade ago, we didn't really understand what the ice sheets were doing, and we just assumed they were doing nothing. 
And that was a bad assumption. That's why the uh, predictions from the last IPCC report were so low and why the ones for the report before that were even lower. Uh, we, we now know that the ice sheets are, are losing mass. They're melting a lot faster than we thought they were, especially Antarctica. The problem is we still don't have good process-based models that we can take heating, warming of the ocean, air temperature increases, and see what the ice responds to. We, we basically have to use some back of the envelope, simplistic models to put bounds on that. You know, some people have argued that it could be as much as, you know, six meters, but they're looking at the last interglacial. And that I, I know most scientists don't believe that that's possible. The, these numbers that we're getting are based on if it warms by this amount, how much mass could physically flow through the fjords that the glaciers are feeding within this amount of time? And that's kind of what the, the best estimates are based on now. Thank you for that question, sir. And the reason I said it about my grandchildren is because not many people in this room are as old as me. So <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I do take that long. Uh, yes, right here. Yeah. Uh, I'm Gene Stern, and this is for uh, Dr. Hafen and probably Dr. Pilkey, but anybody can answer it. I live on a barrier island, Treasure Island. They have their own bear, their own city council. They have their own economic issues, and their issue is always to build more to build the tax base. But they always deal with other people's money. <laughs> okay? It's never their own money. It's the bank's money or whatever, someone else's money. So isn't, isn't this a problem that really has to be addressed at a much higher level because if a city like Treasure Island can build up or more and it's a truly bar barrier island, I mean, this is an issue that transcends that little city that's only concerned about its economic survival. So where do you see this really heading as far as a, a national debate that has to affect the banks and the lending that they do? I guess what I see is that, you know, the, the local communities will do whatever they are allowed to do, all right, within their, you know, their, their management plan and their future land use and all that stuff. And that is dictated by the state. And so where I think the first, you know, level of, of, of discussion has to happen is with the state. The state has to make a concerted effort. Again, you know, this idea of diversifying its economy, you know, not being based on tourism, you know, so that, you know, the only option is not to build more. You know, that cities, even coastal communities, even barrier island communities can have some sort of tax base, some sort of economic base that is not based on building another condo. Um, but again, you know, why, if I were the, the you know, the local government in Treasure Island or any place like that, you know, I would build as much as I was allowed to build because that's, that's what we do. Um, but you know, in the face of, of what we're what we have to, you know, it's it's kind of foolish. But the other, you know, the other problem I think is has to do with time scales. You know, we're all geologists and physicists, and we all think in really long time scales. But really, most planning is done in very short time scales. You know, we only think about, you know, one lifespan. Um, now we're talking about our grandchildren. Okay, so that's a couple lifespans. But you know, this kind of the, the things that are going to happen are going to happen, you know, incrementally over really long periods of time, and we have to start thinking longer term than that. But I'd like to say that I've been extremely uh, encouraged by the response to Sandy in New Jersey and, and New York, in the sense that there's actually some real conversation going on about maybe maybe we shouldn't just rebuild, or maybe we should do something. You know. We haven't come to any conclusion yet that the governor of New York is actually buying some, buying some land with $400 million, uh, but $400 million would buy 40 beachfront houses in Long Island, so, so what? We can't pay for these houses, no question about that. But I, I, the first hurricane I went to was when my parents went through Hurricane Camille in 1969. And I remember in front of every house, if there was a house left, there would be American flags and there, there, this stuff about uh, we're Americans and we're going to come back and we're men. You know, it's a very, very uh, discouraging kind of thing that uh, not 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 learning from what had just happened. But and of course, Camille went over the same area that Katrina went, where you had the 11 meter, uh, 30 plus feet uh, uh, storm surge and. 
my parents house got damaged in the first storm at, at an they were at an elevation of 13 feet and in the second storm in Katrina the house disappeared you know so, so we're getting there maybe maybe we're starting to this is the first time since since Camille that I've heard serious considerations of uh, maybe doing something maybe not just rebuilding back so. and the most merciful way I think of, of responding and so you're not going to do the same thing is not to allow rebuilding of, of destroyed buildings that that but that don't work here on this on this coast full of high-rises but if uh, in other kind in North Carolina it would work dr. Pilkey are you aware of what the reaction to governor New York governor Cuomo's buy buy buyout plan has been yeah it's been very negative uh, right. but that's okay it, with time people will understand the wisdom I'll go up there and vote for that guy if I could. <laughs> well, I read articles in February, uh, not long after he made it in January, and the uh, reaction in two of the coastal counties that he offered it in was very uh, negative. They, were, they said nobody was wanting to move. Nobody was wanting to take it up. And I'd just like to observe that the two questions, one from Mr. Himes and one from um, help me, Gene Stern, uh, showed a contradiction of opinion. Uh, Gene's uh, way he phrased his question was almost 100% different than Mr. Heinz's, and that's where we are in this, in this uh, debate. Uh, another question? One or two more. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Don Pullman. I um, appreciate the most recent comments on uh, the time scale of the issue and uh, for the community leaders and particularly the policymakers and elected officials I would like some comments from the panel on what can be done in the near term and how should we be looking at providing uh, or focusing the, the debate on the things that are important for the community in planning for the next 10 years or 20 years rather than looking out to the 50 or 100 year time frame in terms of the vulnerability, the resilience and the recovery in terms of the critical infrastructure, the kinds of pictures that we saw, what should, be, what should we be looking for? If sea level's rising or climate is changing and we're looking at increasing risk, what should the policymakers be doing to help the community now? You want to start, yeah. Mr. Hayes? Well, they have to start planning for obsolescence, I guess, is one of the things. You know, no building, no structure is permanent. Um, and rather than think about, um, you know, sort of adding to something that's already existing, um, is think about, okay, where would we put it to get it out of harm's way? Um, and those, can, those are not necessarily really long-term decisions. Um, but that's thinking of, you know, beyond the, the sort of end of life of a, of a building or a piece of infrastructure or something like that. Um, you know, the other thing is really since we have so much infrastructure and so many people that are in harm's way, um, then the, the immediate thing has to be better emergency management, you know, better emergency management planning. We've been terrible at it in a lot of ways. Um, you know, so we have to think beyond, it's like, okay, you know, our, our response to Katrina was build the, build the, you know, the, what are your levees higher, you know? And all that did was encourage people to move back into the areas that got flooded the last time. Well, you, you know, you can't think that way. You know, and that's a very short-term decision. Um, but that was what was done. You know, it was not a popular decision to say, well, the Ninth Ward is just gone and we're not going to replace it. You know, there's all sorts of social and, you know, other reasons behind that. But, you know, the, the reality is that, you know, you build a, a larger levy and that levy can be breached. Um, and so those kind of short-term decisions about, you know, instead of just putting back what was there, but thinking about where we can relocate it, where we can relocate people, um, are things that we need to do in the more short term. One more question. Jacqueline? I'll stay, yeah. Yeah, Bob Taylor. I'm an interloper from Canada. <laughs> Come to your meeting. I, one thought about it is um, in terms of trying to solve long-term problems, 
if you, if you think of the time scale when this becomes a serious problem, it's like the people in the 1920s trying to solve a problem for us. And would we have been satisfied with their solutions? Because technology advances so quickly, that, yeah, I think you have to be pretty cautious about using today's technology to solve problems that will be significant in 50 years' time. Any comment? Well, I, I, it's not just, uh, uh, technology is, 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 is largely unpredictable, but uh, on the other hand, we know certain things are gonna happen. And, and as, as Mark was just saying, um, we can do certain things right now, for instance, and, and, and not, not, not make continue to make mistakes that we've been making for the past 50 years. So that'd be the, the, the first thing. We can start an, an attitude towards uh, what barrier islands should be. Uh, it's possible that they will disappear altogether. Uh, over what time frame is hard to tell, but I think we should start to look at barrier islands in, in a completely different way. And, 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 and if, uh, if condominiums don't last 100 years or 200 years, I've never heard of anybody buying a 200-year-old condominium. They don't exist. <laughs> but at some point in time, these buildings will have to be taken down and, and don't replace them. Put in a, 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 a boat launching ramp or a picnic area or something like that. And so we, I think we need to start to think in terms of how differently we can use the coastline. So if it does change, it doesn't require an enormous uh, uh, re re rearrangement of human infrastructure. And the technology will allow us, whatever happens in 2050 or 2060 or 2090 will help us do that. But, but I think we have to start to change attitudes and we can start to do that immediately. Fishing camps like we used to have in the 20s, <laughs> when they got destroyed on the on the barrier islands, that what not much was lost, right, Al? Right, sure. All right. Okay, one more question. That this is going to have to be the last. We're almost we're just at where we were, uh, uh, except for the storm, where we wanted to be. Go ahead. I think that in the the decisions that we make, we have to be sure that ultimately we protect the natural resources that we will always be depending upon. And um, whether it's decision on where people will move to as they retreat from the coastline, we need to be sure that, that um, they aren't uh, relocating themselves to very important natural resource base of the, of the state, um, water resources, our wildlife and biological diversity and so forth. So I, I wanted to just be sure that that point is out and how important that, that fundamental base of natural resources is. The, um, and I would also ask, in your suggestions about what can be done, I, um, it may have been there, but I didn't really see. Getting rid of what we have now is incentives to continue to build. This has been brought up a little bit, but what can we do to stop the incentives right now, whether it's the insurance, um, you know, helping to rebuild and, and so forth? Who is that to? Uh, Dr. Hafen? Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of, of our incentive to rebuild in areas is the fact that we have, you know, government money to support that that you know insurance companies for some odd reason will continue to insure those buildings uh things like that when when those uh when it becomes unprofit well we've seen what happens when it becomes unprofitable for insurance companies to insure in florida they pull out um and you know and that that became really clear with the the hurricane seasons of 2004 2005 um, but, you know, again, from the, having a really good coastal management plan from a government standpoint means, you know, again, making those hard decisions, saying, okay, we're not going to spend our money to rebuild. We're not going to bail out people. Um, we're not going to, 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 to do that. We're going to encourage, we're going to disincentivize that um, by saying you can't, you know, or you're not going to get any of our money to do it. Um, and a lot of people can't you know, in, the, in these coastal areas. They're, they don't have the money to rebuild on their own without insurance money and without, you know, government help. Um, if the government's not going to rebuild the infrastructure, there's no point in rebuilding your home. You know, if there's not going to be a road there, if there's not going to be a bridge there, you can't have your home there. Um, and so you, you remove that one block and, and you know, the, the people will make that decision on their own. I would ask this, name one national politician who would say no to be building in Jersey, New York, and so forth, Connecticut. There aren't any yet. Maybe there will be. I'm sorry we do have to end now. I could go on another hour or two myself, but I want to respect your time. And um, to, first to thank our panel, if you would help me do that.
Thank you for a great discussion. It's been very enlightening for me, and I hope for you. And I want to also recognize our hardworking staff who worked so hard to make this happen. Jacqueline Schuett, uh, Rosemary Carlson, Barbara Rekamper, Dora Milicek, and Nia Edmondson. May we have a, applause for them. Please.